Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. In case if you have come looking for this video, then it's possible that one of your friends or relatives may have been advised to undergo an operation called as ventriculoperitoneal shunt or commonly called as VP shunt. In this video, let's look at this procedure in detail as to when is it done, what are the types of shunts available, how is it done, what are the complications that can happen with this operation etc. Do make sure you watch this video till the end so that you get complete information about ventriculoperitoneal shunt operation. And yes, do consider subscribing to this channel to get more such informative videos. Before we begin talking about ventriculoperitoneal shunt, we need to understand a very important concept called as hydrocephalus because the operation that is the VP shunt operation is done as a treatment to this condition called as hydrocephalus. So what is this hydrocephalus? Inside our brain there is a fluid filled space. Now this fluid is, is somewhat similar to water but not exactly and this fluid is called as cerebrospinal fluid or CSF. And the space where this CSF is present is called as ventricle. So inside the brain, we have four ventricles. The two lateral ventricles, the third ventricle and fourth ventricle. This CSF is produced at the lateral ventricles and then they flow from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricle, from there to the fourth ventricle and they go out to the fourth ventricle and surround the brain everywhere in what is called as subarachnoid space. They will also surround the spinal cord in the subarachnoid space and also are present right in the middle of the spinal cord. In case if there is excess of this CSF inside the ventricle, this condition is called as hydrocephalus. Let me tell you, this is more of a practical thing that I am telling you than a textbook definition. I just want you to understand the basic concept, that's it. So now, this excess of fluid, excess of CSF inside the ventricle can happen predominantly because of two reasons. One, that is the production of CSF is more, which is not so common and two is the reabsorption of CSF is less than what is produced. So it is like in case if the bathroom tap is open and equal amount of water doesn't flow out through the drain, obviously water will get collected in the bathroom, right? So this is what happens in hydrocephalus. In case if the production and absorption are not matching with each other, then patient can have hydrocephalus. As I told you, excess of CSF production as a cause of hydrocephalus is rare, but it can still be seen in these conditions. Well, the other is that is the absorption, that is the reabsorption of CSF uh, being less compared to the production is the most common cause of hydrocephalus. Now that again can happen because of two reasons. One is that the CSF which gets produced at the lateral ventricle goes through the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle and then goes to the subarachnoid phase. Imagine a situation where the CSF which is produced goes through its normal course and reaches the position from where it's supposed to get absorbed but it doesn't get absorbed because of some problem in the mechanism of reabsorption. Now with this there is a complete communication that is from its uh, space of production to its space of reabsorption. There is no block as such. But at that site, there is some problem because of which it doesn't get absorbed. So this is called as a communicating hydrocephalus. Imagine another situation where the CSF is normally produced, but on its way, there is some kind of obstruction. It could be at any level and it could be because of anything like a tumor which has grown inside the brain or blood or any other cause for that matter. So now here what happens, the CSF is produced but it is not able to reach its final destination from where it's supposed to get reabsorbed. This kind of hydrocephalus is called as obstructive hydrocephalus or non-communicating hydrocephalus. 
So now that we know what is hydrocephalus, we need to understand that VP shunt is an operation which is done to treat hydrocephalus. If you ask me, is VP shunt the only treatment for hydrocephalus? Well, not really. There are other ways how hydrocephalus can be treated as well. But in this video, let's restrict our discussion to VP shunt as a treatment of hydrocephalus. So I told you that hydrocephalus is somewhat similar to a condition where you have kept the tap on in the bathroom but the drainage has got blocked and you have excess of water collected in the bathroom. So in day to day life, how do you tackle this? Well, the simple answer would be just, just clean the drainage and let the water flow, right? Well, it is true in case of a bathroom and tap but it's not so in case of brain because if there is absorption problem at the terminal level, there is no way we can correct it. However, in case if it is an obstructive hydrocephalus where the, where the CSF pathway has got blocked because of say tumor or something else, then this logic holds good. You remove that tumor and then it's possible that the CSF pathway reopens and, and then it, get, it might uh, get corrected on its own. Well, anyway, what are the other possibilities? In case if you cannot uh, clean the drainage, uh, what else can you do to get rid of excess water? Uh, well, you might say that uh, we'll switch off the tap, right? Well, again, this cannot hold good in case of brain because we cannot just stop the production of CSF. However, a uh, few medications are given to somewhat reduce the CSF production. We call it as Dymox. Uh, but uh, again, that's that cannot be the solution because we cannot just stop the production of CSF altogether because CSF is there for a reason, it's, it's required for brain. So, what else can you do to get rid of the excess of water in the bathroom? Well, imagine this, you just put a pipe to that collected water and then divert that water to some other place. That also does work, right? Well, this is what is done in case of ventriculoperitoneal shunt. That is, there is excess of CSF inside the ventricle of the brain. So what we do is we put a small tube, we call it as a catheter and then we uh, connect that catheter to the tubing system which will take the CSF to the abdomen. Well, if you imagine that this is going to be a very extensive operation with everything open from head to abdomen, no, it's not so. There will be a very small incision through which the tube is inserted and then subcutaneously, that is below the skin, the rest of the tube is passed to the abdomen and there will be another small incision at the abdomen from where it will be guided to the peritoneal space in the abdomen. So literally you will have a very small incision on the head and a small incision in the abdomen and obviously nothing is going to be visible from outside. Everything is going to be inside. So what it does, it takes excess of CSF from the ventricle and then it diverts it to the peritoneal space of the abdomen and from there obviously the CSF will get absorbed. So this in simple words is the ventriculoperitoneal shunt operation. So let's come to what are the different types of shunt systems available with us today. Well again I won't go in detail about uh, some of the uh, uncommonly done procedures or uncommonly done shunt systems. Let's just talk about the most commonly used shunt systems. Broadly, we have two types of shunt. A fixed pressure shunt and a programmable shunt. Don't panic, it's very simple, I'll tell you. See, imagine a situation that you have put this tube to drain the excess of CSF from the brain to the abdomen. But who's going to tell how much is enough? I mean, what if the entire CSF from the brain gets drained and reaches the abdomen and and there is absolutely and the brain is absolutely uh, devoid of all the CSF. Obviously that can be dangerous, right? So that's why we need to have some amount of check on the amount of CSF flow that happens through the tube. That is done by uh, the chamber which has the pressure regulation. So in simple words, if I were to tell you about a fixed pressure shunt, it simply means that there is a pressure threshold 
above which the CSF will flow. But in case if the pressure threshold, in case if the pressure falls below that, no flow is going to happen. And it, obviously, it's going to be a one-way flow. There's there's not going to be any flow in the backward direction. But in simple words, fixed pressure shunt means there is a pressure threshold above which there is going to be flow, below which there is not going to be any flow. And even in the fixed pressure shunt, we have a high pressure shunt and a low pressure shunt, which are not very common, and a medium pressure shunt, which is the most commonly used shunt system. Coming to the second category, that is a programmable shunt. Before going to that, let, let's understand that why is it important? Well, see, there can be a situation where there is excess of fluid in the ventricle, but somehow that is not reflected proportionately by its pressure. So here what happens, if the pressure still remains low, uh, but the amount of CSF is high, the fixed pressure shunt may fail to drain it. So in which case the patient will have still all the problems of excess of fluid inside the brain. But the fixed pressure shunt is, is not able to do anything because it says, uh, no boss, the pressure has not crossed the threshold, I am not going to drain. Or imagine another situation where the CSF has uh, decreased to a significant extent, say it's, it's almost come to normal levels, but somehow the pressure has not reduced. So what happens? Fixed pressure shunt will say, no boss, the pressure is still high, I need to, I need to drain more and more. So that can lead to over drainage, as simple as that, right? So with the fixed pressure shunt, whether it is a medium pressure, high pressure, low pressure, whatever it is, there is a risk of under drainage or over drainage. So how do we tackle this? So to tackle this, we have another shunt system called as programmable shunt. So what's so special about that? Uh, well, uh, very obvious thing which is so special about that is the cost. While the fixed pressure shunt is available for three to four thousand, I'm talking about the hardware cost. The programmable shunt uh, costs somewhere around seventy to eighty thousand. So, so you see that there is a remarkable difference in the cost. So, if there is a cost difference, it has to be for a reason, right? Yes. So, the peculiarity of a programmable shunt is that once you insert a programmable shunt. At any given time, any number of time, you can just use a programmable, which is an external device, and then change the pressure setting. That is, in case if you feel that there is under drainage, you can reduce the pressure threshold and hence lead to increase in the drainage. Or if you feel there is over drainage, then you can increase the pressure threshold and decrease the flow of CSF through the tube. So the obvious advantage is that after ventricular peritoneal shunt operation with the programmable shunt, any day, any number of time, the pressure threshold can be changed and the amount of flow through the tube can be regulated. These two are broadly the types of shunt systems that we use in our day to day practice. Well, of course, there is another type called as uh, antibiotic coated type, but it is not so commonly used. However, again, it has nothing to do with the pressure. It is just that the tubings are coated with antibiotics, uh, which decreases the chance of infection. Well, now that you know what a ventricular peritoneal shunt operation is, let's look at its approximate cost in different hospital settings of India. Well, if you are considering uh, getting a ventricular peritoneal shunt operation in a central institute like AIMS, PGI, NIMANS, it's going to be a uh, very minimal cost, almost free, maybe maybe somewhere around 5,000, not more than that. While if you consider getting a ventricular peritoneal shunt operation in uh, in any other government hospital, that is state-run government hospital, you may have to shell out, shell out maybe 20 to 30,000. And in case if you get it done in a medical college, uh, your total expense might be somewhere around 70 to 80,000. Mind you, I'm talking about all these things for a fixed pressure shunt. I'm not talking about a programmable shunt. Uh, so in a medical college, maybe about 60 to 70,000. And uh, in a corporate hospital, it will obviously depend on the city. Uh, depending on the city, it might cost you somewhere around 1 lakh to 3 lakhs for the operation. As I mentioned previously, in case if you want to get a programmable shunt, as the material costs slightly higher, you might have to shell out around 70,000 extra 
compared to a fixed pressure shunter. Now let's look at a very important aspect of this operation that is what are the complications that a patient may have to face following ventricular peritoneal shunt operation. Please understand when I say the complications of ventricular peritoneal shunt, uh, I don't mean that every patient who undergoes this operation will have one of these one or more of these problems. No, definitely no, because this is one of the very commonly performed operations in neurosurgery and if everyone were to have one or the other problems then definitely this wouldn't have been so. So these complications whatever I mentioned are rare but yes of course they are possible. So the biggest problem that we are looking at is whenever, whenever we insert some foreign body inside the human body that is it's not just about uh, the shunt, it, it could be the screws and plates that we put in to fix the fracture or whatever it is. So whenever we put in a foreign body inside uh, the human, uh, the biggest risk that we are looking at is uh, that hardware, that material getting infected. So if that gets infected, then yes, of course, it can give a lot of problem. Uh, because of the infection, because of the bacteria which may colonize inside the catheter or inside the chamber, uh, it might just stop working. That is the CSF flow through the tube may stop and uh, the patient obviously is going to have all the symptoms of fibrocephalus again. Or the infection may not uh, be just limited to the tubing, so it, it, can, it can progress further and can lead to what is called as ventriculitis or even meningitis. Now these are, these could be uh, even life threatening at times. The other possibilities are just like how the ventricle in the brain can get infected. Uh, of course, as we know, the other end of the tube is in the abdomen, that is peritoneum. So the patient can end up having infection inside the abdomen or some form of uh, localized CSF collection in the abdomen, etc. Well, of course, there are other possibilities too, but as I mentioned, these are very, very rare. The most common being infection of the entire system. The other problems uh, which uh, I previously mentioned are under drainage or over drainage, which mainly happens in case of a fixed pressure shunt or misplacement or malposition of the tube instead of it being positioned in the right space, that is the lateral ventricle, uh, inadvertently it might get uh, placed somewhere else and hence cause damage to that part of the brain or sometimes uh, what can happen is uh, something called as migration of the shunt. So it, it, it may not stay in the place even though, even though if it was put in the right place uh, because of some reason it may just migrate from there and then may just end up coming out from, from different areas. Well, these were a few points in brief about uh, the ventricular peritoneal shunt operation. And another important question that a lot of patients ask me is that, okay, so we put in a tube, is it going to be permanent or do we remove it? Well, most of the time it's going to be permanent. We, we do not intend to remove it unless there is some problem, uh, most common being shunt infection. Otherwise, uh, almost all the time when we plan to do a ventricular peritoneal shunt operation, the material is going to be permanently inside the patient's body. So I hope this video was informative. If so, uh, consider giving a thumbs up and also consider subscribing to this channel to get more such informative videos. Take care. Thank you for watching.